Nicola Sacco, murderer or martyr? If you just started watching this video to quickly find out who this Nicola Sacco person was, then here's the short story. Nicola Sacco was an Italian immigrant who lived in Massachusetts in the early 1900s as a shoemaker. His life was not so peaceful, though, because his life ended in 1927 when Nicola was electrocuted for alleged robbery and murder. How did a seemingly innocent Italian immigrant go from being a shoemaker to a murderer? Some people think he didn't. Some people think Sacco was wrongly accused. Others think the court was just trying to get rid of unwanted immigrants. Still others think Sacco really did commit the crimes but shouldn't have been executed because the incriminating evidence was faulty and minuscule. So who truly was this Nicola Sacco? Was he innocent? Was he guilty? Was his name even really Nicola? I dare you to keep watching to find out. As with every great story, we must start at the beginning. Nicola's story starts out in Torre Maggiore, Italy on April 22nd, 1891, his birthday. It is believed that his father worked in the olive oil business and that Nicola did not have a lot of formal education. Although not much of Nicola's early life is known, once Nicola immigrated to America, his story starts to get a bit more interesting, or at least more informative. The year was 1908, and Nicola was about 16 when he and his older brother, Sabino, traveled to America and began working in construction in Milford, Massachusetts. However, Sabino returned to Italy in 1909, leaving Nicola alone in America. Nicola worked in construction for a while and also worked in the textile business, but ended up working as a shoemaker for the rest of his career. In 1912, Nicola married Rosina Zambelli, and not too long after, they had a son, Dante. While working to provide for his little family, Nicola also became involved in some anarchist groups. Today, anarchy has negative connotations of violence and disorder, but to a new immigrant like Sacco, anarchy looked quite appealing. Merriam-Webster defines anarchy in multiple ways. A, an absence of government. B, a state of lawlessness or political disorder due to the absence of governmental authority. Or C, a utopian society of individuals who enjoy complete freedom without government. To Nicola Sacco, anarchy sounded very much like definition C, a good solution to racism, poverty, and injustice done to people by a dominant government. The fact that he held fast to his anarchist beliefs may have contributed in some ways to his eventual accusation and execution. While attending anarchist meetings, Sacco met a fellow Italian immigrant, Bartolomeo Vanzetti, who made his living by selling fish in Plymouth. Although the two acquaintances probably would have never guessed it at the time, their lives and names will be linked together forever in history. One of the more radical anarchist actions Sacco took, along with Vanzetti, in his life was escaping the draft and running to Mexico during World War I. Later in his life, Sacco explained his actions by saying, So that is why I love people who labor and work and see better conditions every day develop. Makes no more war. We no want fight by the gun. We don't want to destroy young men. Why? What is war? The war is not to fight for the free country or for better education, but they are war for the great millionaire. They are war for business. What right we have to kill each other? I've been working with a German fellow, with the French, many other peoples. I love them people just as I could love my wife. Why should I go kill that man? What he done to me? He never did anything, so I don't believe in no war. I want to destroy those guns. As you could probably tell by the quote above, Sacco's English was not great. This fact would come back to haunt Sacco later. Also, fun fact, it was during Sacco's time in Mexico that he changed his name to Nicola. Originally, it was Ferdinando. Sacco and Vanzetti returned to the States after World War I was over, but life did not simply return to peace and quiet. On May 5, 1920, both Sacco and Vanzetti were arrested. For what? All Sacco and Vanzetti were told was that they were being arrested because they looked like suspicious characters. Naturally, Sacco and Vanzetti assumed their radical, anarchist ideals had resulted in this arrest. Many Americans saw anarchists as a threat to the American way of life. It made sense that although Sacco and Vanzetti had not necessarily done anything illegal, they were being arrested simply because of what they believed. Supposedly, when questioned, Sacco and Vanzetti lied about different relationships with other anarchists and immigrants in order to cover up any traces of unpatriotic ideas. While Sacco and Vanzetti believed they were arrested for their anarchist ideals, they were actually being arrested for robbery and murder. A few weeks earlier, two crimes had taken place. One, an attempted robbery, and the other, a robbery and murder. 
Felix Frankfurter, a critic of the soon-to-be, long-drawn-out, and possibly biased Sacco Vanzetti case, detailed the latter, and more important, crime in an article in the Atlantic newspaper this way. At about 3 o'clock in the afternoon of April 15, 1920, Parmenter, a paymaster, and Berardelli, his guard, were fired upon and killed by two men armed with pistols, as they were carrying two boxes containing the payroll of the shoe factory of Slater and Morrill, amounting to $15,776.51. From the company's office building to the factory through the main street of Salisbury and Tree, Massachusetts. As the murder was being committed, a car containing several other men drew up to the spot. The murderers threw the two boxes in the car, jumped in themselves, and were driven away at high speed across some nearby railroad tracks. Two days later, this car was found abandoned in woods at a distance from the scene of the crime. Witnesses thought the robbers and murderers looked Italian, and after doing a little research and looking into the getaway car, the police were convinced Sacco and Vanzetti contributed in some way to the Braintree crime. Were Sacco and Vanzetti guilty? Would the court and jury give a fair trial? Although the trial went through and Sacco and Vanzetti were both executed, those questions have not been fully answered. Felix Frankfurt was convinced that the court acted unjustly and tried to prove his position in his article in The Atlantic. But in the end, Sacco and Vanzetti were convicted and sentenced to death. One website about the case says, Today many historians now believe Sacco was probably guilty and Vanzetti was innocent, but that the evidence was insufficient to convict either one. I have come to the conclusion that we might just never know the exact truth behind the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. But it's up to you to decide. Here's a flavor of the evidence, trial, witnesses, court, and time in prison surrounding the whole Sacco and Vanzetti case. On May 21, 1921, at Dedham, Massachusetts, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were put on trial for the Braintree murders. The judge was Webster Thayer, who was known for his distaste of anarchism, and actually quoted as saying, in reference to parts of the Sacco and Vanzetti case, Did you see what I did with those anarchist bastards the other day? The jury consisted mostly of very white Americans, many of whom could be swayed by notions of nativism and patriotism to look condescendingly upon the immigrants. Both Sacco and Vanzetti could not speak English very well, and often seemed to misunderstand the questions asked in court. Communication is a huge thing in a trial, and the men's broken English may have further distracted the jury from finding out the truth. One of the big arguments for Sacco and Vanzetti's guilt was their supposed consciousness of guilt. Frankfurter described consciousness of guilt in his article in this way. Consciousness of guilt meant that the conduct of Sacco and Vanzetti after April 15 was the conduct of murderers. This inference of guilt was drawn from their behavior on the night of May 5, before and after their arrest, and also from their possession of firearms. In the eyes of the police, Sacco and Vanzetti acted quite strangely and even lied when they were interviewed on the night of their arrest. Why would an innocent man lie? However, Frankfurter says later that during the time between the murders and their arrest, neither Sacco nor Vanzetti acted strangely, as if burdened by any terrible crimes. In fact, it is very likely that Sacco and Vanzetti lied on the night of their arrest because they thought they were being arrested for their anarchist beliefs. The lies covered up any proof of anarchism, so the two, or so the two men may have thought. When questioned in court, Vanzetti made clear that on the night he was arrested, he did not know why he was being arrested. The police never told the two men they were suspects of robbery and murder. Another big part of the trial was the witnesses for and against Sacco and Vanzetti. One of the main witnesses who said she saw Nicola Sacco was Mary E. Splain. During the questioning on June 9 through 10, 1921, Mary said explicitly that Nicola was the man she saw in the getaway car. And by saw, I mean she looked out of the second story window and saw the car driving away for probably less than three seconds. Was Miss Splain really a reliable witness? Also, this same Miss Splain had actually seen Sacco a whole year before this trial. But at that time, when asked to identify Sacco, she replied, I don't think my opportunity afforded me the right to say he is the man. Other witnesses testified to seeing Sacco in Boston on the day of the murderers. Who was telling the truth? Another blow to Sacco was the ballistics report. Sacco was carrying a gun when he was arrested, which increased the police's suspicion of him. One of the mortal bullets, found inside the murdered person, matched the type of gun that Sacco owned, a Colt 32. Some think that that one bullet convicted Sacco. He was definitely guilty. 
others think foul play might have been involved, or think that no one actually proved the bullet was shot through Sacco's gun. Once again, who knows the truth? Whatever the evidence said, it was enough for the court to pronounce Sacco and Vanzetti guilty on July 14, 1921. They'd be executed by electric chair. Eugene Lyons, a follower of the case and biographer of both Sacco and Vanzetti, described Sacco's time in prison in this way. Sacco was the Latin at his most impetuous, a man of emotion rather than logic, driven literally to madness on at least two occasions by the ordeal of imprisonment and waiting. The separation from his pretty red-headed wife and his two children from friends and work consumed his flesh and shook his reason. A week of incarceration for a man like Sacco was more terrible than a year for the more phlegmatic and contemplative Vanzetti. Sacco was a caged and raging animal. Vanzetti seemed a monk in calm seclusion. While awaiting execution, Sacco received a note from fellow prisoner Celestino Medeiros saying, I hereby confess to being in the South Braintree Shoe Company crime, and Sacco and Vanzetti was not in said crime. Celestino F. Medeiros. Could this save Sacco? Medeiros was part of the infamous Morelli gang, who could have easily pulled off a heist and run like the Braintree crime. In fact, it made logical sense that the Morelli gang committed the crime, but this supposed lead was never followed up. For that matter, all of the appeals made to the court to examine new information were denied by Judge Thayer. The decision was final. Although the actual date moved around, Sacco and Vanzetti were finally electrocuted on August 23, 1927. Tons of people around the world protested this verdict and punishment. Was the American legal system corrupt? Had the court ruled unjustly? We may never know. But what we do know is that Sacco and Vanzetti will be remembered for a long time as immigrants who are not treated the way anyone in America should be treated. From the records, it is pretty clear that neither man was innocent until proven guilty. Sacco himself declared in court, I know the sentence will be between two classes, the oppressed class and the rich class, and there will be always collision between one and the other. We fraternize the people with the books, with the literature. You persecute the people, tyrannize them, kill them. We try the education of people always. You try to put a path between us and some other nationality that hates each other. That is why I'm here today on this bench, for having been of the oppressed class, while well, you are the oppressor. To many people, Sacco and Vanzetti were true martyrs and examples of the oppressed in America. Fifty years after the execution, Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, had this to say about Sacco and Vanzetti. Today is the Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti Memorial Day. The atmosphere of their trial and appeals were permeated by prejudice against foreigners and hostility toward unorthodox political views. The conduct of many of the officials involved in the case shed serious doubt on their willingness and ability to conduct the prosecution and trial fairly and impartially. Simple decency and compassion, as well as respect for truth and an enduring commitment to our nation's highest ideals, require that the fate of Sacco and Vanzetti be pondered by all who cherish tolerance, justice, and human understanding. I hope you enjoyed this video, learned a lot about Nicola Sacco, and will continue to ponder what you think the verdict of the Sacco and Vanzetti case should have been.